Hello and welcome back, once again, to the massive YouTube iceberg. Today, we'll be finishing up tier 7. You know, I kind of failed to even out this tier properly, so I kind of figured this would be the longest of the three parts of the tier by a long shot, considering it has the most entries. However, it kind of wasn't, so sorry about that. Either way, sit back, get comfy, and let's get this started. Starting off this part with the return of the weird YouTube glitches, as you probably should know if you've watched every part up to this point, YouTube was founded in 2005 by Javed Karim and two other guys no one knows the name of because they didn't make Me at the Zoo. Both Me at the Zoo and Javed's channel were created on April 23rd, 2005, about two months after YouTube itself was founded. However, oddly enough, there exists a channel that says it was created on September 16th, 2004, which was before, according to Wikipedia, they even had the idea of creating the platform. The channel belonged to the It Gets Better Project, a non-profit LGBT organization, and the organization itself was founded in 2010, making this all the more strange. So, what's the reasoning? Uh, there isn't one. Yeah, it just seems like it's just some weird, unexplained glitch that has apparently existed for a while. Nobody can really think of a solid explanation for this one, unlike others. Toilet channels are quite a specific brand of YouTube channel that are a little hard to find if you're looking for them, but they're definitely littered throughout YouTube. Basically, there are these channels where people will upload hundreds of videos showing off various toilets and public bathrooms and stuff like that, showing off how they work. These channels usually don't get a lot of views, obviously, outside of when they're posted to external places like r slash deep into YouTube, such as in the case of Leroy Myers Williams, 10B7, and Toilet Fan 1, who I would assume is the number one toilet fan, which is pretty fair. He has been making toilet videos for over a decade now since he was a little kid. Comments on these videos are sparse, but when they do happen, they're always having civil discussions about how much they like or dislike the toilet. I think we're playing another round of is this fetish content here, which, if you ask me, I don't think so. I think there's just a small amount of people who hyperfixate on these kinds of things. Toilets aren't the only thing people do this for, as I've seen similar things for elevators, where there will be people who ride elevators and record themselves doing it. It's kind of strange, but an epiphany I had is that these channels are not that much different than people who hyperfixate on trains and airplanes and stuff like that, which is a phenomenon you're probably a lot more familiar with. Also, while researching, I found a video from 2008 where a guy throws a toilet off a balcony and it shatters. Oh, I don't care. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to share that. Jackson Hole is a small town in Wyoming of about 10,000 people. It has an oddly far reach in popular culture, being featured in films such as Django Unchained and Rocky IV, video games such as The Last of Us, and being a second home for celebrities like Harrison Ford and Kanye West. Thanks to these facts, and also the fact that it's home to three whole ski resorts and is pretty close to Yellowstone, makes it an oddly popular tourist destination for rich people, despite the fact that it's basically in the middle of nowhere and the least populated state in the nation. C. Jackson Hole is the main tourist company of the town, and they have a YouTube channel. This YouTube channel constantly has around 50 live streams going on at all times, with webcams set up all across the town that have been live streaming since 2016. This would make these streams the longest running live streams on YouTube, even longer than the lo-fi hip-hop girl stream. By extension, this would also make these streams the longest video ever uploaded to YouTube, each being around 7 years long and counting. These kind of webcams are actually all over the internet, with there being entire communities of people gathering up live streams of unsecured security cameras. However, it's quite rare for the streams to be posted intentionally by the area they're from. It's a pretty nice looking town, so go check it out if you want. Also, the channel posts highlights from the stream sometimes, like, um, this. He thinks everything's a fucking game. Zom refers to an old zombie apocalypse flash animation released on YouTube in 2012. It follows the story of a man and his daughter trying to escape a quarantined city which is specifically mentioned to be Rochester, New York for some reason, after a virus has taken over and the United States government doesn't want it to spread. The animation is set to Sweet Dreams Are Made of This by Emily Browning. The art style is definitely a product of its time, no doubt about that, but I actually found myself enjoying it quite a bit. Give it a watch if you haven't. The Nameless Channel with the Xbox profile picture, sometimes known as the Unholy Channel, is a channel on YouTube that simply doesn't have a name, which is kind of weird, isn't it? Well, that's not actually why this channel is on here, as we've already covered videos and channels without names way back in Tier 3. However, this channel is notable because there is a weird glitch with it a few years back where the layout would freak the fuck out and not know what to do. 
there would be four rows of YouTube logos spanning across the screen in place of the channel name. At least that's what it looks like. Every single one of these YouTube logos is actually a link to a different channel. Usually, YouTube only lets you have a handful of links in your banner, but this person somehow had this comical amount of them. Apparently, they did it using an HTTP proxy or interceptor. However, the exploit no longer works and the channel simply displays as normal. Well, besides the no-name thing, that still works. YouTube, in more recent years, has had a really annoying issue with the comment section. Sometimes, when you comment or reply to a comment on a video, YouTube will straight up block your comment from being posted. Now, this is a phenomenon we've sort of talked about, where I talked about the videos where every comment needs to be pre-approved before being posted, resulting in ridiculously low view counts for highly viewed videos. This is different though, as sometimes comments will be blocked beyond the uploader's control. Anyone who uploads videos might be familiar with the held for review section, where comments containing excessive profanity will be sent, waiting for the uploader to approve them. However, sometimes they don't even get sent there. I've actually experienced this phenomenon myself, not from the commenter's perspective, but the uploader. On the massive YouTube iceberg explained tier 6 part 1, one of my friends commented IDGAF the second it was uploaded. In response, I said I kneel. Then someone else replied I steal, followed by an ideal, I peel, I reel, so on and so forth, with about 40 replies by now, probably helped in no small part by me pinning the comment. Every time someone would do this, he would get a notification to his phone, becoming so annoying that at one point, he eventually snapped, dropping a shut the fuck up in response to everybody. And YouTube hid his comment. I had no chance to even save it from the health review section, it was just straight up gone. I'm sure his comment is not the only one in my comment section that has happened for. Just so you know guys, I only ban comments that are literally bots, so if your comment got hidden in one of my videos, that's proof of the whole ghosted comments thing, further cementing the YouTube comment section as being kind of terrible. But hey, at least it's not Twitter. Meyer Lil is an Italian content creator who joined YouTube in 2019. Her main style of content is modeling clothes, but it's kinda clear that people don't watch her content for the clothing she shows off. Many of her videos show off her body in quite provocative ways, with a lot of her videos specifically centered around her boobs and ass. In fact, some of her videos you can straight up see her nipples. To drive home the message further, her logo is literally her name slapped on top of two nipples. As I've mentioned before, YouTube has strict policy against nudity for the sake of sexual gratification. However, Meyer has been on the site for four years, and nothing's really happened to her or her channel. Some of her videos have been taken down, but that's about it. I couldn't really tell you what loophole she's using in the YouTube rules, but clearly it's working, so good for her, I guess. And she is not the only content creator like this, either. Here's another subreddit suggestion for you. r slash YouTube titties, where you can look through Reddit for boobs posted on YouTube, even though you can look through Reddit for the same thing, except not on YouTube. I don't understand Coomers, bro. Scary Mario commercial is a video uploaded to YouTube in 2008 by The Joey Fan. It starts with a message in the classic Windows Movie Maker title font. One day, when I was checking my email, the screen froze. Then this video appeared. Mario, I will never look at you the same way ever again. Then a comically low quality video of a Super Mario Sunshine commercial plays, complete with the unregistered hypercam to watermark. It plays at a ridiculously low volume, guiding viewers into turning up their computer sound. Then it hits you with a jump scare. This is definitely one of the more popular Screamer videos, however, it's hard to understate how common these types of videos were in the early days of YouTube, and also just the internet as a whole. Child me definitely ran out of the room screaming while on the family computer more times than I can count. SpongeBob Beyond is a quite bizarre fan series for SpongeBob SquarePants released on YouTube by a channel called 12th Art Group, and apparently it was an adaptation of a fan comic called SpongeBob in Beyond. The series started in 2016 and actually ended in 2020. Yeah, one of the few animated YouTube web series that actually managed to conclude its story, and it's fucking this. I don't even know where to begin to explain the actual series. Apparently it's meant to be more of a serious storyline for the Spongebob franchise that the show wouldn't normally tackle, where Spongebob and Patrick find themselves in a town called Beyond that's far away from Bikini Bottom. And also the town is run by a mafia of sharks that do things like push drugs and execute people, 
and they're going through a war with a rebellion of dolphin people. Yeah, this shit is insane. It gives me heavy Tales Gets Trolled vibes. SpongeBob and Patrick don't even really have much to do with the story. Many people have compared them to C-3PO and R2-D2 of their series, rather than the actual main characters. You'd think that Spongebob would be the main character of a series named Spongebob Beyond, but in the channel description they explain this. Members of the 12 art animation group have spent years to learn and experience, and now, through the Beyond series, they try to create a new world among Spongebob fans. Second phase for them is to make a series with original characters and a story which can entertain any audience in any age group. So basically, now that they've finished their Spongebob series, which truthfully has next to nothing to do with Spongebob outside of the whole underwater fish people theme, they can now pivot their audience to towards an original series called Tale of Blue that features no copyrighted characters so they can finally profit off of it. And people say indie animation on YouTube is dead. Unfortunately, with all that being said, the Tale of Blue's first trailer was released two years ago with no updates on any of their social media accounts since. Maybe that'll change in the future though. Toucan LDM, from what I can gather, is literally just an animator on YouTube who makes videos about various cartoon properties getting isekai'd into My Little Pony. The series has 23 parts, however it's since been cancelled. I was expecting some kind of controversy surrounding this dude, but from what I can gather, there's not much else to talk about. The videos aren't even really that edgy or disturbing. Moving on, I guess. Peppa Pig and the Bacon is a Newgrounds animation uploaded in 2015 by Lulu VZ. It's one minute long and features Peppa Pig developing a taste for bacon, which causes her to cannibalize both her entire family and herself. There's really not much else to this one either, it's just an edgy Newgrounds animation. Isn't it funny how this is lower than the actual real life cannibal entry? Yeah, that was like six videos ago, only on the massive YouTube iceberg. On certain videos on YouTube, there's a phenomenon where comments will appear to be posted before the video it was posted on was ever published, sometimes even years before the video's upload date. This one actually has a pretty simple explanation. If a video is private or unlisted, and then properly unprivated or un-unlisted, YouTube actually updates the upload date in the description. This is an especially useful feature for content creators, such as myself, who want to upload a video but don't want it to immediately go live. So you can upload it private and then change it to public maybe a day later and it will show up at the top of your subscribers' subscription feeds. So if someone comments on an unlisted video and then that video becomes public again, it will appear like the comment was left before the video was uploaded. He Dies at the End is a short four and a half minute long horror film released on September 1st, 2008 as part of the Screamfest Horror Film Festival. Directed, produced, and written by Damien McCarthy, our hero is simply going through a quiz online that claims to be able to predict when and how the user is going to die. Throughout the short film, the quiz asks strange things such as are you alone, and if startled would you scream, and even do you know the person standing behind you. He looks behind him and finds no one there. The quiz then asks, did that question startle you? Finally, he gets his results. His cause of death will be fright, and then the normally quiet video ends with a loud jump scare. I've never seen this video before researching for this video, however I do remember a very similar website that claims to know when and how you're going to die, and at the end it tells you that you're going to die from a heart attack, and when the time shows up, it says right now. And then it quickly cuts to a real loud screamer. I don't know how I'd find that, but surely someone watching will remember that. On June 10th, 2018, at E3 2018, Bethesda Softworks announced the next game in the Elder Scrolls series, The Elder Scrolls VI, with a very short teaser trailer and not really much else. It's quite the highly anticipated game, with Elder Scrolls V being one of the most influential and popular games of the 21st century. However, it would seem that they announced it a bit too early. Apparently, they didn't even really start production on it until 2013, so like five years later after they announced it. It's for this reason that everyone thinks that this game is basically never coming out, at least not for a very long time. On the official upload of the Elder Scrolls VI announcement teaser, however, one dedicated fan has been counting down, or I guess counting up, the days. Monsieur Dupont has been going at it for nearly 2,000 days writing a comment daily for that entire time. This entry pretty much falls under comment section journals from a few years back, I'd say, so I guess that could have fit into that, but this one is a fair bit less known than someone like Mr. Tortilla. You know, Monsieur Dupont doesn't have a whole video essay about him. I mean, until now, I guess. Barry vs. Larry is probably the most famous and important instance of a YouTube subscriber battle, far more than PewDiePie vs. T-Series. What, what, what do you mean you don't know them? Around 2019, during the aforementioned PewDiePie vs. T-Series subscriber battle, there were a comical amount of channels live-streaming the two channel subscriber accounts 
24-7 because people were really interested whether PewDiePie would win, even though it kind of seemed inevitable what would happen. From these, somewhat of a parody livestream would start, showcasing the fierce subscriber battle between two channels, Barry and Larry, starting from zero subscribers. The channels get a weird amount of attention, being posted on the PewDiePie subreddit, r slash PewDiePie submissions, and soon enough they had hundreds of thousands of subscribers. It would seem Barry has won the war though, as of 2023, he has about 150,000 subscribers over Larry, despite the fact that Larry's actual content is significantly higher in production value and even did a face reveal. Winky Dink Media is clearly the zenith of the 2D animation medium. For about 10 years now, they've been making the Cartoon Hookup series, where random cartoon characters, as well as comic book characters, video game characters, and anime characters will have sex. These videos would always get millions of views, and sometimes even feature, like, underage characters. Which is kinda crazy, but is the kind of shit everyone just thought was normal in 2015. To my knowledge, there's no major controversy with this channel. It's just kind of coomer bait, I guess. <sighs> really? Is, is this really what we're doing now? I guess I knew what I got myself into. How to express your dog's anal glands at home, veterinarian recommended way, graphic, was uploaded in 2017 by Vetnique, a company that sells products used in the veterinary field. In this video, that has 15 million views, they teach you how to, well, express your dog's anal glands, which results in the dog secreting this fluid from its ass. The video obviously features some pretty explicit details of the procedure, as it would need to be in order to properly demonstrate how to do it. I don't think the reason this has 50 million views is because people genuinely want to know how to express a dog's anal glands. However, I also don't think people are, like, getting off on this. I mean, maybe they are, but that's besides the point. In 2019, a domain name was registered called SpriteCranberry.net. It was not registered by the Coca-Cola company, as one would expect, but rather some random person. Several memes were spread all around of people saying to go to SpriteCranberry.net for a free Sprite Cranberry. When you do so, the site redirects you to the anal gland video, specifically a timestamp of the guy inserting his finger into the dog's anus. Yes, that's right, in the year 2019, shock sites were still being created which I kind of thought was a lost art, but here it is only a couple years ago. Though, even this was a lot tamer than the shit they would put on them way back when. Also, this ties back a bit to the cyber squatting thing from the last video, because, like, how has Coca-Cola not taken action against this site? They're, like, legally well within their right to, but they just don't. Maybe they think it's funny. I'm talking about this entry for way longer than I thought I would. Big Butt Woman Farts is a fetish video of a girl lying on her stomach with her ass very clearly visible. About 16 seconds into the video, she lets out a fart. However, listeners with a keen ear might recognize the sound effect. No, that wasn't edited. That's actually the origin of this fart sound effect that's used in a fuck ton of memes. Apparently, the woman in the video goes by the pseudonym Miss Fartsy online, and you can find tons of videos exactly like this one littered across the web. So, you know, if you're into that sort of thing, go for it, you sick bastard. Everybody knows about Bitch Lasagna, the diss track written by PewDiePie addressed to T-Series. During the aforementioned battle, the two channels were having for the number one place of most subscribed. However, what a lot of people don't mention is that PewDiePie actually made a second one where he was getting passed by Coco Melon, the baby channel. The song was simply titled Coco and was uploaded on February 14th, 2021. The video had PewDiePie dressing up as various characters and singing lyrics poking fun at both Coco Melon and the whole content farmy style of content that Coco Melon represents. And he even calls out Coco Melon's audience for being full of virgins. He also calls out the rapper 6ix9ine multiple times throughout the song for some reason. I guess he just doesn't like him. The video got over 10 million views in two days, but then was taken down by YouTube staff. The official reason given was that the video apparently violated YouTube's policy on harassment and bullying, which is kind of hilarious since the video was focused on a corporation rather than a person. Well, it was also focused on six time, but you know. Honestly, I feel like Bitch Lasagna deserved to get taken down more than the Cocomelon one ever did. Like looking back, the shit was low key more racist than the PUBG clip. Motu Potlu, what the fuck is that even supposed to mean? Your language sounds like it came from a mumble rap community. Like, bro? What the- 
What the fuck was he thinking? The second reason they gave was that this could be potentially misleading to viewers, as children could click on it thinking it's for kids, since it has Cocomelon on it, and to be met with PewDiePie speaking quite vulgarly about this children's network. It was a decision that many disagreed with, and to be honest, they could have just said they didn't like that he was saying fucking shit when there were actual children acting in the music video. Focusing instead on the fact that he was bullying a company just kind of seems weird. Either way though, the video has been banned from YouTube since, along with all re-uploads, and I'm not even allowed to show you guys footage of it, although it does exist re-uploaded elsewhere on the internet. Since then, PewDiePie has not made any more diss tracks, and three other channels have passed him without much fanfare. I bet you didn't even know he's not in the top five anymore. Fortnite NSFW skin videos is an entry that's fairly self-explanatory. Much like the videos in the Or Grease playlist, there are tons of videos where people will either be really horny for Fortnite skins or just straight up post porn of them to YouTube. I don't know how they get past YouTube's moderation algorithms, especially since these videos are age-restricted, which most likely means that YouTube themselves or their algorithms see the video but not mark it down. Okay, well actually, you can age-restrict a video yourself, which might help with gliding past censorship. Still though, this is definitely the kind of thing that YouTube would remove, but they're still here for some reason. Yet another strange YouTube glitch is that sometimes videos are shorter than the timestamp on the progress bar would suggest. It's very rare and only on a select few videos. Not only that, but the opposite also happens where a video will keep going even after the progress bar completes. The videos this happens to are quite random and happen to several videos across all time periods of YouTube's existence. For example, this 2014 re-upload of Bjork's self-titled album appears to be 32 minutes long, which is actually how long the album is. However, if you click the very end of the video, the timestamp ends at about 14 minutes. Another example is this Jacksepticeye video that is supposed to be 15 minutes long, but the progress bar only goes to a minute and a half before ending. Finally, another example of this happening comes from a video called Baroque PSCM3 by Haruka Nanase. This video is from 2010 and appears to be one second long before you click on it. Open it up and it's actually 16 hours, 17 minutes, and 17 seconds. There's not really any concrete reason for why this happens. Sometimes it happens when the video is uploaded, sometimes there's evidence of it being normal and then over time developing the glitch, and other times YouTube specifically patches it out. Apparently it's something about fucking with the file's metadata before you upload it and YouTube just gets really confused. But that's just a theory. I'm sure you're probably familiar with the YouTube original emojis found by opening up the emoji tab on desktop YouTube comment section. Well, actually, you probably aren't because ain't nobody used that shit. These include the old buffering icon loop, the 404 monkey, and the YouTube logo. In March 2020, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, YouTube introduced a whole host of new emojis, which is kind of a bizarre response to a global pandemic. Like, not evil or anything, but why was YouTube's first instinct to make a bunch of new emojis? A lot of these are COVID-themed, like a social distancing emoji, a hand sanitizer emoji, a hand washing emoji, a Zoom emoji, a do the five emoji, and even a stay at home emoji, which is literally just the YouTube logo with two black lines over it for some reason. There's also some miscellaneous ones included, like a good vibes emoji and a learning emoji and a cat and dog emoji. These are just generally kind of baffling to me because not only do not a lot of people even know these exist, but also even among the people that do know they exist, they don't really get a lot of use just because of what they are. Like, when am I ever going to use the learning emoji or the elbow bump emoji? I feel like they plan to add more, but they literally only added them in 2020, so we get these time-themed emotes that are no longer relevant. Finally, there's also secret Easter egg emojis, which is what the century specifically refers to. You can't actually select these through the standard emoji menu. You actually have to type out the specific name. These include an emoji of Jake Peter's head, who I understand is a deceased member of the YouTube gaming community, and this emoji was made in memory of him. There's also three gummy worm emojis of varying colors, if you want that. There's the YouTube gaming logo, a sweating blob emoji, and finally, the awesome face, or epic face, or whatever you want to call it. Like, straight up, not some weird blob version of it, just the original PNG, which is easily the best one in my opinion. These are all available both in the comment section and live chat. 
Bart Baker is a YouTuber you've probably heard of before. He's an American social media personality and YouTube-based comedian who is best known for his song parodies that were very popular in the early 2010s. You know, Miley Cyrus' Wrecking Ball, Katy Perry's Dark Horse, Nicki Minaj's Anaconda, back when those songs were, like, relevant. At his peak, he was one of the most influential figures on the platform, with his music videos regularly hitting view counts of tens of millions, with his most popular work nearly hitting 200 million, and him having nearly 10 million subscribers. However, nowadays you don't really see him around very often. It's pretty likely that younger viewers might not even recognize the name or any of the videos I just showed you. And there's a very specific reason for that. It's important to note that these parodies would rarely be family friendly and more importantly, not advertiser friendly. And I don't mean that these videos were malicious or featured bigotry or what have you. It was merely just swears and sexual references and things like that. I mean, besides the, the Bound 2 parody, he, uh, he did blackface for that one. Yeah. Not only that, but since every single one of his videos would literally just be titled Song Artist Song Title, and then a parody at the end, for quite some time his videos would literally be one of the first results when you search up a good amount of popular songs and music videos. This is most likely a huge part of how Bart Baker gained such a large following and viewer base. Popular music artist makes famous music video, and Bart would follow soon with a parody version still in the wake of the video's relevance. However, his videos getting so popular, and associating themselves with some of the most popular artists of the time period, meant that YouTube took issue with his vulgar ways of attracting attention. It was for this reason that in 2017, in the wake of the very first adpocalypse, Bart Baker announced he would no longer be doing the parody videos that he founded his entire career off of. He explained that this was because of YouTube's wave of demonetization hitting him pretty damn hard. As a result, he would not have the money to pay the production costs for his parodies, as he literally did have people on payroll. As time went on, his videos would steadily decrease in views, probably due in part to YouTube fuckery, but also the fact that his style of conduct was just kind of falling out of relevancy. Needless to say, he was fucking miserable at this time. He made a couple desperate bids to regain relevance, like creating a rap persona called Lil Clorox, uh, running for president in 2016 with a Times Square billboard, and most notably in 2019, in a baffling move, he shifted his target demographic to China. Okay, so bye. Hope you get well. I see you tomorrow, or maybe I'll see you tonight. I don't know. I'll see you in the morning. Bye. Jesus. And he began uploading videos to the social media app Kwai, as well as Douyin, the Chinese equivalent to TikTok, and these videos would be him covering Chinese songs in English. Most of these songs would basically be him glazing China, talking it up to be the greatest place on earth. And apparently, this was a pretty successful move as he would sort of over 10 million followers on Douyin, which is more than he ever had on YouTube. Apparently, this was the result of a contract by a shady Chinese network that promised him internet fame on the level of his prime, in exchange for giving up his personal image to wedge his face firmly in between the Chinese government's ass cheeks. Though he would try and cope and say everything was fine, it was obviously not something he ever enjoyed doing. He would even outright deny it at times, saying that he's loved China ever since he was a teenager. In 2021, he finally came back to YouTube, uploading a video called WTF Happened to Me, Why I Disappeared. In this video, he explains that for the last two or three years, he's been living in Shanghai, doing concerts and tours, and earns tons of money. But now, he's finally forced to move back to America, as he's got really into cryptocurrency, and apparently that's banned in China. This video is really weird, even ignoring the stupid chin filter he has on for some reason, and fans were cautiously optimistic about his return. Then he made one last music video called Poly Doge, which was a minute and a half long, and seemed to solely exist to promote Poly Doge, the cryptocurrency. The video has only managed to reach about 600,000 views, which seems like a decent amount, but when compared to his old view counts, it's downright embarrassing. That was his most recent video, and nowadays it seems like he isn't active anywhere but Twitter, and he'll probably be forever remembered as one of the greatest falls from grace in YouTube history.
Iluomo is another one of those glitched YouTube channels. The channel doesn't have any videos, but this one specifically relates to its related channels tab. It would appear as if Iluomo is subscribed to a whole bunch of channels, like Iluomo, and Iluomo, and Iluomo, and Iluomo, and Iluomo. Countless duplicates of the same channel appear in the channel subscription box, each loading in continually and endlessly. The longer you scroll, the more duplicates appear. I believe this happens for the exact same reason that the Xbox PFP channel thing does, where the channel owner uses an external tool called an HTTP interceptor to make an exploit happen. I actually remember a similar thing happening on the Twitter, sorry, X mobile app, where if someone likes one of your retweets, their account will keep showing up the longer you scroll. The only difference is that the YouTube things happens when someone intentionally does it, and Twitter does it when it has its daily tear apart at the seams moment. White Supremacist Ads is a really loose entry, and I can't exactly identify what it's talking about. I know I said this wouldn't happen anywhere on the iceberg because I'm in contact with the creator of the chart, but even he says he completely forgot what it's actually referring to as he actually added it from a suggestion by some guy on Reddit. The closest thing is that at one point, YouTube would not demonetize videos made by white supremacists and would sometimes even recommend them in the related video section. This is kind of just a reiteration of the extremist pipelines entry from tier four, but hey, it's all I got. The World Is Ending and I'm Late For Work is yet another one of those weird 3D animated parody of children's cartoon channels. This time, their main claim to fame is their series of uncanny, hyper-realistic Peppa Pig animations called Peppa Pig Horror, where Peppa Pig and her family is faced by eldritch horrors. Not only that, but they also have videos about Spongebob, Thomas the Tank Engine, Bluey, Rugrats, etc, etc. You know, just as many popular baby properties as possible. It's kind of weird how prevalent and popular this kind of thing is. Like, a couple years ago, Winnie the Pooh entered public domain, and immediately people began making horror movies about the series. Like, like, why? Why is that the first thing you think to do? The Dancing Pig is a film released in 1907, making it possibly the oldest video on the entire chart. I mean, besides medieval found footage, of course. It's a silent short film and features a woman and a giant anthropomorphic pig dressed in fancy clothes dancing around. Then the woman takes off the pig's clothes, leaving him naked and embarrassed, and then he comes back out dressed in woman's clothing. Finally, the short ends with a final shot of the pig showcasing its wide range of facial expressions, which are still pretty impressive nowadays, but back over a hundred years ago, this must have been monumental. Although, it does look really fucking creepy. You know, really old movies like this just kind of have that thing where they're more scary looking than a lot of horror movies, despite doing so completely unintentionally. One weird looking giant fat pig costume entry onto another, Party Boom is a Ukrainian channel that joined YouTube in 2011. From what I can gather from the channel description and now defunct website, Party Boom was most likely a venue for parties and weddings and things like that based in Kyiv, Ukraine. Which, based on that location, I think I can understand why they haven't uploaded in a long time and their website doesn't work. Anyways, most of their videos consist of what you'd expect from a company like this, being videos of weddings and other social gatherings that occur here. However, that's obviously not why they're on the iceberg. No, no, in some of these videos, especially their most viewed videos, you can see this company's mascot, which is a pig costume with red lipstick, a giant ass, and most notably, six naked breasts. Yeah. Some commenters theorize this is supposed to be Peppa Pig's mom, which, I mean, like, maybe. In these videos, this pig character will usually appear before the groom at the wedding and give him a lap dance and a strip tease and sometimes even dressing up in a dominatrix outfit. This happens in front of everyone at the wedding, including the bride, as well as the groom, and the bride's entire extended family, including children, which I'm sure definitely won't awaken something in them. The groom doesn't usually seem super thrilled about it, but everyone else does, including, again, the bride thinking it's funny. I don't really understand why someone would hold their wedding here, and I don't really understand under what context would this be normal. Like, usually with these things, I'm like, okay, this seems weird, but I'm not a part of this country's culture. Obviously, it seems weird and alien to me. But this? What the fuck, Ukraine? This is a video I believe was uploaded by an Indonesian YouTuber named Korigor, who is pretty popular in the Southeast Asian side of YouTube. Now, right off the bat, I don't speak a lick of Indonesian, let's make that clear. However, I do know one of the words in the title, Aoki Gahara. 
That's the Japanese name of the suicide forest in Japan, the very same one that Logan Paul got into so much controversy in early 2018 for filming a YouTube video in. It was a ridiculously dumb idea for Logan to do that. Not only was it completely disrespectful to those who committed suicide in the forest, but there was also immediate, intense media backlash, and his career suffered for quite some time, with some cutting business ties with him over it. We've obviously already discussed that way back in Tier 1, so what happens in the video this entry is talking about? Well, the exact same thing. In late 2018, not even a year after the Logan Paul controversy, the Indonesian YouTuber did basically the exact same thing, heading to the forest to record a vlog. In fact, it wasn't even really an accident. He constantly made references to Logan Paul throughout the video, saying this is Logan Paul 2.0 when he finally found a dead body. Some could say Corey was even less respectful than Logan, as at least Logan had the decency to start fake crying with his stupid Toy Story hat, compared to Corey, who could only think about how much publicity he'll be getting. Knowing how much controversy Logan Paul's video caused, though, why in God's name would Corey do the exact same thing? Well, the reason is quite simple. Logan Paul didn't really suffer that much. He still continued to grow as a celebrity, and the Suicide Force thing didn't really do much to impede on that. He became a professional boxer and professional wrestler, and is currently the fucking WWE Champion. It just kind of shows you that, if you really think about it, the concept of getting cancelled isn't even real. Unless you, like, murdered someone, or committed sexual assault or something. Corey probably recognized this and wanted a slice of the pie, but couldn't even give enough of a shit to do something uniquely horrible, so he just copied what Logan Paul did. After the video's upload, Corey definitely received backlash, the video got taken down by YouTube, he published an apology, and now he has 3 million subscribers, and regularly gets 100,000 to 200,000 on every video upload, and even made a goddamn reaction video to his own video. Joshua and the Promised Land is a rather infamously and laughably bad 3D animated children's film released in 2003, or 2004, depending on who you ask. According to IMDb, the film is a riveting tale filled with many moments of happiness and pain. It's supposed to be a retelling of the Old Testament from the Bible, which, have you guys ever noticed that when a children's film is supposed to advertise Christianity to young kids, it always looks a lot worse and lower budget? I don't know, that's just something I've noticed. Anyways, the plot is that a young lion child named Joshua gets isekai'd into the Bible, filling the role of the biblical figure Joshua. The film is over 50 minutes long and was written, directed, and animated by one man named Jim Lyon, whose name kinda makes the animal choice make sense. And he made it over the course of four years, which you would definitely not be able to tell just by looking at it. In 2013, it was uploaded to YouTube in its entirety by user WebBadger08, who found some guy selling it for one pound on eBay. The user even claims that the DVD box compares the film to C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, which is an insane thing to say, not only because the movie is bad, but also because it's literally just supposed to be a retelling of the Old Testament. The film was popularized by a popular YouTuber... Okay, it's an obscure, poorly made children's film with naked furries. What YouTuber do you think popularized it? In late 2021, Saberspark published a Joshua and the Promised Land reanimated collab with nearly 400 animators, which has a lot more effort put into it than the original film. Lay Reddit Army is a bit of a rabbit hole, to say the least. For a little background, around the early to mid 2010s, there was an emerging trend of videos being posted to Reddit and then making the front page. YouTube was pretty established at this point, but Reddit was still a pretty new thing. That being said, Reddit's user base was already known for one thing in particular, being really insufferable and unfunny, which are traits that the site is heavily associated with to this day. Like, for real, it's an issue. I would probably use Reddit way more since the site's layout is probably the best of any social medias, but people there are just so painfully unfunny. Anyways, when a video was posted to Reddit and gained a lot of updoots and Reddit gold from kind strangers, there would be a swarm of comments from Reddit or Neckbeards saying that they came here from r slash videos or whatever. As a result, people were understandably annoyed by these comments and made a subreddit called r slash reddit army, which chronicled the weird people who would flood in from Reddit as a result of videos being posted there. And so, of course, to piss off both Reddit and everyone else, a trend was started in the comment section by someone named Berta Lovejoy. On every single video that would get posted on Reddit, you could always find Berta Lovejoy role-playing as a radical feminist. What a sickening video. Music teacher, please set a positive example for these girls as they are the future of our society. Rage Against the Machine are famous for having lyrics that promote crime, especially the one in this video which is literally called Killing in the Name, with constant references to murder. This band has also been known to promote anarchy and violence. This music teacher is raising a generation of violent females. It sickens me seeing this kind of sexist treatment of young females get so highly praised. 
Berta Lovejoy, feminist, promoter of equality, love and peace. Berta would not be the only one of these, however. Countless accounts would be created parodying common Redditor tropes. Neckbeards, weeaboos, memers, atheists, low-key racists, and comically large superiority complexes. On a video of a dog thinking a door is closed, commenter Narwhal Bacon writes, People laugh at the dog for believing in an imaginary door, yet it is perfectly fine for people to believe in an imaginary god. I would also like to point out that my Reddit senses are tingling. This is going to turn into a viral video. Maximum karma inbound. Prepare for gold. <laughs> On a video of a man lifting weights, Larry Milkskin writes, This man can only be described as a weakling and a fool. He believes he is an alpha male just because he lifts weight and has had sex. In order to truly reach a peak of physical appearance, one must consume dairy constantly. I myself drink a minimum of seven bags of milk per hour. Look at me. Perfection. This... <laughs> this black man lacks the purity of a sparkling glass of white milk. Also, all men should wear a stylish fedora and grow a healthy beard. In the early 2010s, people were clearly much, much worse at identifying satire than they are now. And these comments pissed off casual YouTube viewers, the original uploaders of the videos, and even fellow Redditors. On r slash reddit army, some of the most upvoted posts of all time come from disgruntled Redditors that liked browsing YouTube comments. You all are 14 year old stupid trolls. All you members of the lay reddit army have nothing to do in life. You thrive on hate. All that comes out of your time are useless YouTube comments, which people look at for one second and then look somewhere else. You need to work harder and do something that actually has an effect. Leave this message up. Otherwise, it will be confirmed that you cannot handle the truth. I hate you all. We get it. You're trolls. Basement dwelling, unemployed, 16 year old, overweight, virgin trolls with nothing better to do with your time. Some of you might even be over 30. And that just makes it even more sad and pathetic. Get off Reddit, bro. Quit posting stupid shit on YouTube and try to talk to a real live woman in person. It's not funny. It's just sad. I feel bad for anyone that actually subscribes to this subreddit, but you're trolls. Every single one of you. So somehow, me imploring you to better yourself will feed your need to post shitty comments while sitting in the dark watching Firefly reruns and drowning your sorrows in Doritos and Mountain Dew? Lay Reddit Army was a trolling campaign of which I could only assume the goal was to make Reddit look bad, which in all honesty it kind of succeeded in doing. Many people still associate the site with comment section dwelling neckbeards that get into arguments with random people online. The army was met with a ton of hatred from people online at the time, but in hindsight this shit was funny as fuck. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end, and on November 12, 2014, Redditor Drum Diary released the Chrome browser extension Hide Fedora, which automatically automatically prevents any Reddit army comments from being seen, pulling from a list of blacklisted channel IDs and removing them if it finds a matching one. Obviously, this extension could have been prevented if YouTube had a simple block feature, which it still doesn't have, but either way, this put an end to lay Reddit army, and the subreddit is now a ghost town. Truly the end of an era. The Report of the Week, sometimes affectionately known by the nickname Review Bra, is possibly one of the least controversial figures in the history of YouTube. Essentially, his content mainly consists of his series, Running an Empty Food Review, where he dresses up in very fancy clothes and speaks very professionally while reviewing food. What food does he review, you may ask? Uh, fast food and other forms of junk food. The dichotomy between Review Bra's attire and presentation, and just the general sloppiness and unhealthiness of the food he's reviewing, gained him a pretty easy to understand appeal, and he's now a multi-million subscriber channel. Being one of the most recognizable and well-liked figures in the food review side of YouTube. Eat your heart out, um, Joey's World Tour and Nick Akato Avocado. However, his now 12 year long YouTube career was not entirely the wholesome and pure persona he lets on. Not that he himself has ever done anything wrong, but rather his fans. In 2016, he alleged that in one of his Taco Bell food reviews, he was being gang stalked the entire video, and he tried to pay the perpetrators no heed, but it was quite scary. The immediate response from his followers was quite mixed. Some thought that he was correct and that he was actually being stalked, but others had doubts. 
theorizing he was developing some form of paranoid schizophrenia, as gang stalking is a phrase commonly attributed to the mental illness. This was further supported by the fact that no one appeared in the video, and also some people just thought he was making it up for publicity, which would be grossly out of character for him to do so. In the next video, a Buffalo Wild Wings review, he appears shaky and disgruntled. Before getting into the review, he clarifies what happened in the last video. He says that a grain van, which you can actually see at one point in the video, began following him around throughout his day, and people would get out of the van and begin pointing a camera at him and stalking him, in a story that didn't really match up with the one schizophrenic individuals will tell. The very next day, on July 30th, 2016, a post was submitted anonymously to the 4chan board poll. Anyone want some rare review bras I stole from his house last night? Also, my van was featured in one of his latest videos. Top Keck. The kid is paranoid as fuck now. Also, I know his entire Nightwalk route he takes. Attached to the thread was old family photos. Now, most people think this guy was bullshitting. A lot of the photos could be found in Review Bros Facebook, and it was also entirely likely that it was just some shit poster taking advantage of a well-known situation. A month later, viewers noticed that he had a mattress in the back of his car while he was filming. Xbox theorized that he got kicked out of his house, and Review Bra responded saying, I still have good relations with my folks, I just have to keep moving. He would post another reply repeating, I just have to keep moving. On his subreddit, he clarified, I am living out of the car at the moment, I haven't been kicked out, and family relations are great. I don't want to share too many details in this moment, just know that things are okay. It was most likely he was living in his car out of paranoia, people coming to his house. Luckily, throughout the year, his mental state would slowly improve, and it would seem the stalker situation has resolved, in his own words. Now, was he ever really stalked? It's a point of debate for sure. It's entirely possible that the fan was simply a group of fans, and he had finally reached the point of fame where he had what are essentially paparazzi, and the 4chan poster could have, again, just been bullshitting. That being said, he made it clear he didn't publicly reveal all the details about the situation, so there are some things we don't know. And also, even if it was all bullshit, it still must have been pretty intimidating for someone of his following, who wasn't used to all the fame yet. Omaiwamo is a song by a music producer called Deadman. You might recognize it for its use in TikToks or that one dancing Minecraft parrot video, you know, the one where he jumps into the end portal. It's hard to understate this song's popularity as it has nearly 100 million streams on Spotify and 45 million views on YouTube. What many people don't know is that this song is actually a remix, if you can call it that, of Tiny Little Adiantum, an arrangement of Gensokyo Past and Present from Toho 9. Amaiwamo is, all things considered, a pretty lazy remix. It's basically just the same song, but they included the line from Fist of the North Star, Omaiwamo Shinderu, and put a trap beat over the song. Which, I mean, would be fine, right? Even though Amaiwamo isn't the most original song and is heavily carried by the tiny little Adiantum sample, that's still legally and morally a fine thing to do, since that is technically free use, and sampling is a thing pretty much all your favorite modern artists do, Especially if you're into hip-hop, and especially especially if you like Vaporwave or Future Funk and that kind of shit. Which quite literally just takes old music and slows it down or speeds it up, and then adds drums and reverb. It's a valid way of making music, even if a lot of people don't personally like it. However, where this song drew the line is that Deadman, or more likely his label, began copyright striking people for using quote-unquote his song. These copyright strikes included Tiny Little Adiantum itself. While I'm personally a huge advocate for free use and, for the most part, anti-copyright, this is a blatant attempt to take advantage of free use laws. Nowadays, though, it seems like both songs are still up on YouTube, and Deadman's video even advertises the original song and the song producer. So, uh, we're all good now, I guess. Nizamul Khan is a decently popular YouTuber from Noida, India, with over a million and a half subscribers. His main form of content is bike stunts, and he's been doing it since 2014, gaining a steady following. However, in 2020, he went dark for mysterious reasons. It would soon come out that Khan was arrested on account of murdering the brother of his girlfriend. Apparently, the brother did not approve of Khan and his girlfriend's relationship, so Khan killed him alongside two accomplices. I couldn't actually find much else about this murder case, surprisingly, since most of the news reports on this case are in Hindi. However, it would appear he was released on bail following his imprisonment, and it would seem he even released an apology video on his YouTube channel, which wasn't actually an apology video, but rather him saying he didn't do that shit. And all the comments were in support of him, wishing for justice to fall upon him. 
I'm not sure if he's actually being truthful because again, this video is in Hindi and captions are turned off for some godforsaken reason. But considering that he was literally convicted and bailed out, I'm gonna assume he did that shit. Either way, since then, he's continued uploading videos to this day. Alexander Bissonnette was a 27-year-old university student from Quebec, Canada, majoring in politics. I'm assuming, judging from the fact that he's on the iceberg, he had a YouTube channel. I could find some clips and documentaries of him addressing the camera in vlogs, but I couldn't actually find a specific channel. Probably got deleted, I don't know. Anyways, Alexander was heavily interested in extreme right-wing politics, especially American ones like those of Ben Shapiro and Donald Trump. Yeah, he wore Make America Great Again hats in Quebec for some reason. Anyways, in 2018, Alexander drove to his local mosque and opened fire, murdering six people and injuring 19. Afterwards, he fled the scene, planning to take his own life, but instead contacted authorities and turned himself in, and the shooting earned himself life in prison, and it's gone down as one of the most infamous shootings in Canadian history. If you're this far down on the iceberg, I have little doubt that you're aware of the now-defunct British video-sharing website LiveLeak. It's a website that's quite similar to YouTube, however, there's something that sets it apart from YouTube that made me reconsider including it in the YouTube Alternative section in Tier 6. LiveLeak has a specific focus around the free share of real footage that would normally be censored on other websites like Facebook and YouTube. Now, unlike somewhere like BitChute, which focuses around things that are censored for political views, LiveLeak centers around footage of war, terrorism, murder, and many other gory world events. The site was heavily associated with gore, there's no doubt about that. On LiveLeak, you could watch people die in the most brutal of ways pretty easily. However, it's also been an important site in giving people a taste of what really happens in the real world. Many political events, such as ISIS beheadings of United States journalists, the execution of Saddam Hussein, and even certain non-violent videos of citizen journalism have only been available on LiveLeak. Which, if you ask me, I think that's the kind of thing that the people have a right to see for historical relevancy's sake. Either way, LiveLeak was shut down two years ago as of this video's upload on May 5th, 2021, and now redirects to a revival site called ItemFix that bans gore. So, like, what's the point? All of LiveLeak's former content has been wiped from the site, and anything that wasn't archived is lost to time. But you know what's weirdly still up? The LiveLeak YouTube channel. Yeah, for some reason in 2012, LiveLeak created a YouTube channel where they re-upload popular videos on the site that they deem are safe for YouTube, featuring street fights, police cams, car crashes, workplace accidents, and yes, even people dying. I'm honestly kind of amazed that this channel has never been taken down. Of course, it's worth noting that I'm not entirely sure this channel is actually run by LiveLeak, as LiveLeak itself isn't linked in the channel's about page, instead just being social media's account for specifically LiveLeak channel, and also the banner isn't even the right logo. Either way, it's still pretty crazy this is a real channel that you can access on YouTube. Oh, buddwire.mpeg, awesome. For the uninformed, Robert Bud Dwyer was an American politician who served as a Republican member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, a member of the Pennsylvania State Senate, and finally, before he died, Pennsylvania State Treasurer. Bud Dwyer was, from what I can gather, a pretty honest man as far as politicians go. However, in the early 1980s, the Pennsylvanian government discovered that, erroneously, Federal taxes had been overpaid prior to Dwyer's administration, and he was tasked with resolving the issue. He awarded a contract to Computer Technology Associates, a California-based firm, to determine compensation. He was then found guilty of 11 counts of conspiracy, mail fraud, perjury, and interstate transportation in aid of racketeering, and was scheduled to be sentenced on January 23rd, 1987. However, the day before, convinced of his innocence, Bud Dwyer arranged a press conference in the Pennsylvania State Capitol building. In this conference, he would announce that he had intentions to die, and told everyone with a weak stomach to turn away or leave. He then promptly pulled out an envelope that contained a loaded revolver. He held the gun to his mouth and pulled the trigger, taking his own life live on television, an event that was broadcast on various local news stations across the state, 
and even later aired on national television, though the gunshot was obviously edited out. To this day, the subject over whether or not Bud Dwyer was innocent is debated. Many believe he was falsely convicted, and others, including state officials, maintain his guiltiness. To tie it back, for a time, the raw, unedited footage of Dwyer's death was available to watch on YouTube, under the title, BudDwyer.mpeg, however, it seems to have been taken down. And finally, we end off the tier with the infamous Russian brick video. This is possibly the entry I've dreaded talking about the most when it comes to this iceberg, at least of the ones I've actually heard of. I am not going to show this video, especially not the fucking audio, so you can seek it out for yourself if you wish, but I am warning you, it's one of the most disturbing, haunting even, videos available on the internet, and really fucked me up the first time I watched it. You have been warned. Full video, woman killed by brick through windshield, sometimes simply called a Russian brick video, is a video uploaded by YouTube user Fanta in 2012. It's Russian dash cam footage, so you can look only on poorly, of a car occupied by a family driving down the highway. The description clarifies that it's in the Rostov region of Russia. The car is driving past a large truck that's transporting bricks. A single brick randomly comes loose and flies right through the windshield of the car, nailing the driver's wife, later revealed to be 29-year-old Olga Gaikovich, directly in the head, killing her instantly. It takes a few seconds, but you can soon see the vehicle stop, and Vadim, the woman's husband, begins screaming and crying in terror and sadness, soon followed by his brother and brother's wife, and even their infant child, who were all also in the car with them. According to the description, she was immediately rushed to the hospital, but pronounced dead two hours later after multiple attempts to revive her failed. I think maybe the worst part about this video is that you can never actually see what happened to Olga, only the husband's visceral, blood-curdling screams, realizing his wife's life had been ended in the most unpredictable and unpreventable way. One second he's driving with his family, and the next, his wife's fucking skull is split open. I think it takes the cake for the most disturbing video I've seen on the internet, even more so than actual gore videos, as it leaves more to the imagination, and that's the worst part. And that's it for tier 7 of the massive YouTube iceberg. I'm gonna be honest, at the start I thought this part 3 was gonna be kinda mid compared to the first two parts of the tier, since a lot of them are really short since I didn't have much to talk about, but by the end I found myself thoroughly enjoying the entries, some of which being the longest interest in the iceberg so far. Looking forward, tier 8 looks fucking insane, so look forward to the start of that in the coming weeks. I don't have much else to update on, thank you for supporting my videos up to this point, and see you all next time in the first part of tier 8. See ya.